Hey, so Margie and I recently ran a workshop via Zoom, of all places, uh, for Data Color and the Guild of Photographers. I'll pop some links to both those people down below. It was really bizarre for me because I was talking at an empty screen with no one else in the room apart from Moggy, who is currently destroying my desk. Moggy, can I leave my pen alone? Anyway, they've Anyway, they recorded the whole video for me, so I'm gonna upload it after this. I hope you enjoy it, it's about an hour long, it's a bit rambly, grab a tea or coffee, beer or gin and tonic, and yeah, enjoy. Enjoy? Moggy, you've got fish in your fur. Thank you very much. Oh. This is weird, I can't see anybody I'm talking to. I it's know, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, yes, it'll be a little bit strange, but um, because it's a webinar and not a meeting, so yes, it's, it's a very lots strange lots thing. Lots of people with us this evening. But Brilliant! I'm going to pretend people are listening, and yes. then uh, we'll sort yes, of feel a little bit more normal. <laughs> um, my, my sort of plan of action for this, I'm going to have to remember to talk here as well, rather than to my screen, um, <laughs> is that I'm going to sort of talk about a little bit about what I do, so there's some context to it all, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to sort of work through the entire procedure of color accuracy. Um, from sort of concept to execution and then perhaps show a few images if we've got time at the end to sort of explain yes. the editing to it. Um, now, myself, I work with food exclusively. It's all I shoot. It's the only thing I do. Um, people stress me out because they keep moving <laughs> and ruining various bits. Um, so I'm a food photographer. I'm just going to quickly do a screen show because I would imagine most of you don't know what my work looks like. So let me show you. Oh, I hope you all do. It's fabulous. I'll dock out now so that thing you can I do. On Isn't that all good me. for the screen show? There we go. It is um, perfect. Brilliant. So my work is sort of, I'm looking at the screen now. This is weird. I can't really see anybody at all. It's very strange. I'm talking to myself. If people walk past my office, they're going to be laughing at me. So my work is all based around colour and vibrancy. Um, the, this is the front page of my website. This is pretty much all personal work on here. I don't tend to put too many commissions on my actual website. Um, and this is what I do when I get booked by brands. It's to shoot this style of work for them, or sometimes just some very generic packaging work. Um, and then I'm represented by a lovely lady called Lisa, who is my agent. So she has a similar sort of thing on her website where she'll showcase my food. And this is where I get my bookings from, I guess. Um, and again, it's all very, the work she shows is all very much my personal work. Um, although we share other stuff, the personal work sort of what gets us booked. So this is what we like to put out there into the world. So as you can probably tell from this, color is very important to my work. It's a very intrinsic part of the process. So I'm going to try and explain to you all my process for getting the colors how I want them to be, which isn't necessarily perfect. But I always think with any sort of digital capture, the best thing to do is to capture perfect imagery first and then move on from there. So let me stop sharing the screen. I should be back on video. There we go. Right. So when we're shooting, we obviously have a lens, camera, lights, and the subject. And this is our sort of first port of call for color accuracy. Um, and, and the way that I'm going to explain this, we're going to have to go backwards and forwards a bit because some of them have different factors which then relate back again. Um, so if we, if we assume that we all have a 35 millimeter camera, so a I've got a Canon 5D, um, Nikon have something, Sony have something, Fuji might have something, I don't know. Anyway, they all have a 35 millimeter camera. All of these sensors, they roughly get the same amount of information, but they all have different processes. So if we shot with the same lens with different camera bodies, the raw files would all look different. And it's not just the camera bodies that will look different, it's also the lenses that look different. And with a lot of work that I do, we're shooting a series. We want our work to have a, a some sort of like continuity. So we want the colors to be as accurate as possible from shot to shot. Now, the obvious thing to do is shoot with the same lens and the same camera body, which is pretty much what I do. So I use, so what this is called, a 5DSR with 100 mil Zeiss. This is my pretty much go-to setup. But sometimes I need a wider lens. And that means bringing in a 50 millimeter lens and I don't have the Zeiss 50 millimeter, it's a Sigma one. And they have very different color casts on the sensor. So even if we've got the same camera and we're starting to use different lenses, we start to bring in different colors based on that. This is very weird not being able to see anyone's response. I'll just keep rambling. Um, so we've already got these two major components of photography, the camera and the lens, which are gonna have a huge impact 
in the colors that we can capture. Now, there's no sort of right or wrong in terms of what we capture or best or worst. It's just you have what you have and you sort of have to work with it. But there's some tools we have which can make sure that all of these things come out with a very similar and very accurate color consistency. Um, this would be particularly important for wedding photographers or event photographers, especially when I used to shoot weddings when I started out. We'd often have th two or three photographers at a wedding. We'd all bring our own kit. We'd all have different camera bodies, different camera brands, and the files would look all completely different. So we'd have to try and correct them to make them look right. And back then, we didn't know about color checkers, um, which are these swaps. It's called the spider checker. Um, which sort of give us a good base level. I want to go into this in a bit more detail, but we didn't. I didn't know about these. They've existed for ages, um, but I'm just a bit slow off the boat. So we've got our lens, we've got our camera, and the sort of final element to this sort of capturing of colour in terms of physical kit is the lighting. Now, if you're working with natural and available light, you have the problem that throughout the day it sort of moves around. Wait there, Mugs. She's tired. Um, and if you're working with flash, unless it's a very expensive flash, you have the problem that the color consistency can change a little bit. So one of the things that we make sure we do in this studio is to have high-end flashes, which have a real good color accuracy. So we use Bron color heads. Um, when I used to use speed lights, we had Canon ones, and then we had the Godox ones, I think they were. And Canon and Godox speed lights for a one-off shot are pretty much the same, but when you're pumping out 500 shots back to back, the Canon ones have really good color accuracy, whereas the Godox ones, they sort of swerve in and out of being too blue and too warm and all over the place. So they're the sort of nuts and bolts of your, your capturing, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, but all of these elements have a real impact in what we're going to get as a final image in terms of colour. So I'm going to sort of take an example here. I'm going to go back and screen share quickly so I can show you an image so we have something to talk about whilst we're doing it, if I can find the button. Do, do, do. Now, I'm not a big Lightroom user here, so bear with me. Um, here we go. So this here is an image from my portfolio of a gold bar of chocolate. And we shot this with the 100 millimeter Zeiss on the 5DS. This is the same chocolate, but with a slightly different scenario. And this is a different chocolate with a very different scenario. But these three images here look very similar. They have a, a good continuity to them. And one of the big things in professional photography is that you have to have a very specific aesthetic and a very specific look to your work that people can really go, ah, this is so-and-so's work. Now, in order to get this, first of all, we obviously have to have the consistent lens, consistent camera, and the consistent light. But then we have to calibrate the camera. And this is like the first part of color editing. So if you look up here, if you use Lightroom, and you click on this grid, hang on, I've got my thing in the way. There we go. Whoop. Down here, we have loads of different calibrations for our camera. So these are our color ones. Um, now, this here is a way to calibrate cameras to see the same. Now, if you use one of the swatches that I showed you all earlier, and you take a photograph of that first, you can use the software and data color to calibrate that camera to be completely accurate in terms of the color space. And I found that, because I use a phase one for a lot of shoots as well, comparing a Canon 5DS using this swatch to get the colors is very similar to the color space of a phase one, for example. It's not too far off. Yes, you're several million colors short, but for a lot of things, it doesn't matter. Now, once we've got this sort of accurate colors, that's when we sort of give ourselves the, the space to edit. And it also means that if I'm shooting these here with different lighting scenarios, I can make sure that what comes into Lightroom, once we've chosen the profile, is very consistent. Now, I'm just going to quickly try and open up the question bit if I can get to it. Where are we? I can keep an eye on that for you, Scott. I think everybody's just intrigued. Is everybody... Uh, am I losing anybody yet? Is this still no, making sense? No, we're still... We're all we're good. Still Super. It's, very, it's very weird talking to yourself. <laughs> I didn't realise. Uh, Have you not done one of these before? No, I've not. No, I'm just sort of gosh. rambling at a screen. It's like a brain dump oh, of information. We are um, all here and people are making comments on your beautiful cat. Oh, yes. <laughs> She's... Hey. Um, She's very intrigued, keeping she's, an eye on proceedings. She's been asleep all day. She doesn't really do anything apart from sleep and cuddle. Um, she's also really hard to photograph because she's got white fur. Oh, gosh, yes. And then a black face. Yeah. It's like the, the worst combination. For <laughs> um, a photographer. But you know how it's done, so I'm sure you can do it. I have very few photos of her, actually. It's quite <laughs> embarrassing. Um, but anyway, yes, the, um, the colours. So one of these big sort of elements of this is getting the colours... Um, getting the colours to look as 
consistent as well as accurate as possible. So once we've got our lens and our camera and our lights and we've taken the shot of the color swatch, that's when we can sort of start to move along. Let me just open up my finder. And we'll just pull these two files in. Now, th this part of photography here is kind of the really boring techie part of photography. And I should preface this with saying that I am not a techie kind of person. Um, when we do shoots for sort of like the bigger shoots, we make sure that we have digital tech involved and we have a retoucher. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure they're all doing their own little bit. So a lot of this will be done by them. Um, and this here is one of the things we'll do. So we'll take our image. These here are bacon frazzles, um, which are kind of like a crisp, which tastes like bacon. It's disgusting, but awesome at the same time. Uh, so this is like a very typical shot that I would take. And then throughout the course of a day, we'll probably take 50 shots of these, not because we need 50 of them, but because we'll take a shot, make an adjustment, take a shot, make an adjustment. You can obviously see it all in live view anyway, but I always find it best if we do it this way so we can also then start to add a lot of the uh, post-production to it. Now, I often shoot into Capture One rather than Lightroom. Um, the data color spider isn't native for Capture One. You have to use a bit of a weird workaround using some third-party software, but it works pretty well. I've been testing it out a lot recently. Um, and that really sort of helps me get these colors. So the way we do it is we'd get the shot ready like this. We'd make sure we've absolutely nailed it. Now, this is one of the bits where we're going to go backwards a little bit because with the lens, if you look at your lens, you probably don't have an aperture ring on it. Let me show you what I mean. Gosh, it's quite weird controlling the cameras as well. So on this lens here, to change the aperture, there's nothing physically on the camera. You have to do it in here rather than on the lens. So every time we take a shot, the aperture is going to do like a close and open, close and open. Now, because they're called things like f2.8, f5.6, you assume that everything is very consistent, but it's not. It's pretty slapdash. So if I shoot 50 images at f10, there'll probably be four of them which are underexposed and maybe four which are overexposed. And that has an impact on the color. So we'll often take, once we've got the final shot ready, we'll probably take another five or 10 shots of it exactly as it is, just to make sure we've got it right. And then once we've done that, we'll clear everything out of the shot we place this color checker passport in its place. Now, I'm not going to do the full thing on here because there were two reasons. One is, if you're watching this, you probably don't have perfect calibrated monitors yet um, and you won't see anything. And two is, it will take me ages to close it down and open up and all that sort of stuff. And so I've just been rendering out a monstrous raw 4K video. So once you've got this, you have to shoot it under the exact same lighting scenario that you've already been working in. Um, let me just get the screen share back up. Du, du, du. You can tell I can't multitask. There we go. <laughs> we're on, we're on, there we go. Um, so once we've got, so we've got the crisps here, we get our final photograph and then we go, that's good. We get sign off from the client and I'm shooting this onto a, an old iMac in my studio. I've got a studio tour video going on my YouTube channel later today. I think about half eight or something like that. And you'll see it's like this big old iMac. We do calibrate it for every single shoot for the monitor, but it is not as good as the BenQ I'm looking at now. Um, just because it's old and it's lost a few of its marbles. Um, we then sweep everything away and we take a few shots of this. And again, the reason we take a few shots of it is because we want to make sure that any discrepancy in the aperture blades opening and closing is cancelled out and we get a good level image. Cameras are never as accurate as you hope they're going to be. So this is a real good way just to make sure you get the perfect one. You then have to do some stuff. I'm going to try and get a link sent out to all of you because I have to watch this every time I have to do it because the digital tech would normally do it. You have to set the right black point, the right white point, and the right um, gray point. You export this as a DNG, and then you close down Lightroom, reopen Lightroom, and then when you come to these color profiles, there'll be a new profile in here with whatever you've named it. And the difference that you will see, you won't see it as much as if I do it here now, but if you do it on your own one, these colors will change completely. Now, if we've done a shoot where we've been using three different lenses and two different camera brands, we can make it so the color palette is almost exactly the same across the board. So this bit here is like the first real calibration. And this is calibrating your camera at this stage. We're going to talk about monitors and print later on. But this is the first big thing to go for. So I got given one of these three years ago by somebody. Um, and I always thought they were just a waste of time. Um, but then when I got given one, I was like, ah, oh, these actually work. They have like a bit of a, a life 
like they don't last forever. There's like a little fade checker thing here, but I've always lost them before the fade checkers actually run out. Um, but this is how we calibrate this bit. Now, if we then go to do another shot and we change anything in the lighting, we add a flag, a scrim, a silk, we move a light, we change the power. We have to shoot a brand new one of these anyway. So normally throughout a shoot, if we're doing six shots in a day after every single shot is signed off, we'll take a fresh one of these just to be sure. You'll also find that when we used to use Bowen's lights, throughout the day, the white balance changes on Bowen's lights. It gets slightly warmer throughout the day. So having one of these after each one, we'll just try and normalize all of those bits. Right, I'm going to have a quick look at the questions just to see whether I have missed anything important up to this point. We've got a few questions going on. So I'll just roll through them quickly. You can, shall I read them out for you? That'd be great, yeah. Yep, so this is from Lou. What happens when you have to match a colour of the product? I shoot packages and clients want images to have the same colour as the package, almost Pantone swatch matching. So for this here, there's a couple of things. One will be in the way that you light it. Um, so you're going to need to have a very even light, uh, which is often why people have huge, like 10 foot uh, parabolic light modifiers. Um, because this way you can have the light far enough away or focused enough that the light is even across the scene. You then take a shot with one of these and this will get your color reproduction as accurate as it can possibly be for your camera. Um, once you move to sort of medium format, you get a greater color depth bit, which will give you more colors. So sometimes, say you photograph a, a bowl of oranges for a Canon camera is a nightmare. Uh, the sensors really struggle with that. Whereas on a phase one, you get a much better gradation and tonality to those oranges. So mm -hmm. one of these, and then as many or as big a camera as you can afford to buy, I guess, will get you the most accurate matches there. Brilliant. We've got one from Joe. Do you consider it 100% essential to use this colour calibration card every time you make a studio session? No. Um, and if I have time at the end, I'll show you a shoot I did a couple of days ago where we didn't use it. Um, but I'll also explain why I sort of wish I did use it. I'm off when we're ever doing test shoots and we don't have a full crew, I forget to do stuff like this. <laughs> um, sometimes it just doesn't matter. Um, and other times, it's a real pain. You're never really sure which way it's going to go until it's gone that way. Okay, great. And from um, and just to add to that, does the grey card fit the same purpose? Kind of. So the grey card will give you a white balance. Your grey card is sort of one of these where here, I think it is, there we go. So I'll give you the white balance. Mm -hmm. But what this does, it will then go, well, this colour red here, our software knows what red this should be. Your camera's got its own interpretation of it. We will give you the true colour red for this. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd be amazed at how much these colours change when you do a before and after on your monitor. Wow. Um, so we've got the next one is, you say you take a lot of images at the end to ensure the aperture is correct, but how do you know which one is correct? Good question. Um, I go for whichever one happens the most. <laughs> uh, you never really know I mean, it doesn't really matter as long as you've got a consistent accurate image yeah. where you think the shot of this here is the same as the final image then if you're shooting maybe 30 images for a client you need to make sure it's whatever comes out most often will be the one you go yeah. for so you don't have to try and correct them because even if one's a third of a stop underexposed because the aperture blades overshot it a little bit making that correction has a huge impact on both the color and the contrast so mm -hmm. it's not as simple as just bumping one of the files up a bit in post okay brilliant this is for this is from mark who is a landscape photographer forgive me if it's a silly question but as a landscape photographer what are the advantages of setting the correct colours when in post-processing? I'll be changing the colours to suit the mood of the shot. Um, pretty much the same as for anyone, I guess. With these making the colours correct, let me just go back and find another image. Am I still on screen share? Yes, I'm still on screen yeah. share. It's very confusing for me, this is. Um, <laughs> let me just go into what I've got here. Here we go. So this is a, this is a portrait, which is a bad example. Let's go to this one here. There we go. This is a, a shot of a beer garden, which we shot in my studio ages ago uh, as part of a workshop. And wow. I took a color calibration shot and then I adjusted the colors to suit my taste because this is not an accurate requirement of imagery. However, what I find is there's certain scenes. So here, for example, this red meat on this brown wood and all these reds together, or if you ever take a portrait against someone against a red brick wall, you'll find your camera really struggles to separate those colors 
but if you take one with the the grid first of all it gives you that extra little bit of um help to get a starting point so just because i mean if i'm doing a, a commercial shoot for somebody and it has to be color accurate i will absolutely go for the accurate colors and just go there we go these are 100 percent accurate let's go for it mm-hmm. but then for something like this i will use it to get does that go full screen when i go full screen yes oh i've lost the camera there um something like this if i was I, I took a correct color for it and then I changed them anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so I changed the blues in this because I didn't like the blue background. I chose it at the time, but then we kept the correct colors for other bits. So it's sort of like getting yourself in the right ballpark and then making the creative decisions afterwards. Yeah. So getting yourself yeah. the best possible Very starting point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is why I don't always use them because sometimes I just go, I look at the first frame and go, do you know what? That looks pretty close anyway. I'm, yeah. I'm good with that. We'll work with that. And other times I think well, this is a bit tricky. We'll give ourselves a helping hand in post. Yeah. Brilliant. And just relating to that one, would you still use the colour swatch if you were shooting outdoors, say horses or dogs? Ooh. Depends. If you have a day which has very consistent lighting, like it's clear blue skies or it's completely greyed out, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, if I was using flash for the images, then absolutely yes. But if it was really changeable, I would probably lose more shots by trying to get one in there than I would you have to have an assistant with you. Um, mm-hmm. When I did used to work with people and shoot commercial stuff with people involved, we'd often have somebody just standing nearby and every few frames I'd throw the swatch in. I call it a swatch. I'm not sure if that is what it's called or not. Uh, but I'd throw the colour swatch pad in and we'd get a quick frame of it and just hope that it helped us a little bit. And if it didn't, we just undid it. Um, but nowadays I like everything to be perfectly controlled. So yeah. I like <laughs> keep it nice and simple. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. We have got more questions. Did you want to go through them or did you want to carry on for a little bit? Um, quick, go through the questions first because then I'll be starting a new sort of part okay. of the th- session, I guess. Okay, so this is um, relating to the grey card again. What's the difference between the process you are explaining versus using an 18% grey card? So the 18% grey card will only give you white balance. So if I look on this right-hand side here, your 18% grey card is for these two sliders here. Whereas when we're talking about the the full colour swatch, we're sort of heading into these territories here where we're adjusting hues, saturation and luminance of these colours at the same time. So it's quite a big adjustment. You can obviously make it by hand, but the chances of you remembering what the scene looked like perfectly, and I don't know if anyone's ever played with the hue sliders, but like you move them a little bit and your image is ruined. Mm-hmm. It's sort of, there's not a great deal of forgiveness in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, the 18% grey card will get you the correct white balance, but to get the correct colour balance, which is a slightly different thing, you need a full palette of colours and the software sort of go, right, this mustard here should be this colour. Whereas the grey card will only tell you that this mustard here should be this warm, this cool, this magenta, or this green. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, I think. Yeah. I um, think it makes sense. Yes, it, does, it, does. it makes it sense does. in my oh, head. <laughs> I was reading at the same time as listening no, to you. Like- <laughs> yes, it does. I promise you, it did. Um, so, Vicky's also asking, um, which I think. I think I know the answer to this. Um, do you take a picture of the whole thing as in all of the colours or just individual colours? It'll be the whole palette, won't it? Yes, and it also has to be as evenly lit as possible. And this is where, so on a shot like this, so this one here is one where we had to use a colour swatch because mm-hmm. trying to remember the colour of the cheese and get it exactly right is a real pain compared to just shooting a swatch. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's evenly lit, so it's nice and easy to go, ah, we'll get the colour swatch in here, it will look perfect. Whereas something like this where we've lit a very thin slither of a cocktail glass, you can't get the colour swatch in there. It's just not physically viable. You can't get the even lighting on it, so you just get like a weird stripe and then it would be all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if possible, whenever possible, get a colour swatch in there. It, yeah. It's one of those things that I always wish I'd done when I get to post-processing if the colours are difficult. Um, mm-hmm. Like these ones here we didn't shoot colour swatches with and these were a nightmare in post. Um, um, whereas I could have just put the swatch in yeah if you did but just instead i struggled just, for ages time. <laughs> but oh. that, that's the way it goes <laughs> oh gosh um right so we've got uh we've got another one asking about what about the when the light changes throughout the day so would you would you keep on checking the color card throughout the day as they're 
Here we go. If there's so much variation throughout the day with the lights and camera, do you need to take new calibration shots throughout the day too? Yes. So every so you, I'll take a studio example first. Every time you change your lens, camera, camera settings or light settings or light setup, you need a new one. And if you're outdoors, all of those apply as well as if the natural light changes. So if a cloud suddenly comes over, you need to take a new swatch, mm-hmm. um, which is why... If I was doing a wedding and I turned up to the evening venue, I'd probably take one shot with my flash on my camera, bounce off the ceiling and go, here's a good ballpark. But Mm -hmm. in all honesty, for the rest of the day, I'll be so stressed, I'm not going to remember to do this. And if we're doing the portraits down at the park for a wedding, I might get my assistant to throw it in for a shot when we're lighting it and then continue. But it's very difficult with candid work. Um, Yeah. If I was a sports photographer and it was even lighting, I might take a shot of it at the start, just so I've got that calibration mm-hmm. and then continue shooting. And then every now and again, I might just go, ah, do you know what? Things have changed a bit. Let's just get another shot of this. Um, just to try and give us that. It's mostly to give you a helping hand in post. It saves so much time, um, especially when your colors are all over the shop. It's a real and Canon cameras. I don't know what everyone else shoots, to be honest, but I shoot with, I've always shot with Canon cameras. Mm-hmm. And if you have a Canon lens on a Canon camera, the colors are awful. Um, which is why I mostly work with other brand lenses on Canon cameras. So it's a bit of a Canon issue. And I know that Sony has some really weird colors because I had someone send me some Sony files once. Um, And yeah, using a color swatch, that sort of thing is really useful. Yeah, fab. Okay, so another one we've got. So how do you use that color grid in Lightroom? You say match the white, gray and black to make a profile, but how? Uh, I'm going to send you a link to a video for this because there's someone who explains it on YouTube really well, um, which is basically what I do whenever I have to do it because I always forget the set numbers that the black point and the white point have to match up to. Um, there's loads of... Everyone assumes that because I work as a photographer that I know how to do everything. But yeah. every time we have to focus stack something in the studio, I have to watch this really boring video on YouTube reminding me how to do it because there's one yeah. step if you get it wrong, the whole thing it's doesn't apart. work. It falls apart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's um, yeah, it's one of those ones where every time I have to do it, I watch the video. Yeah. Because um, people also assume that we shoot a lot as well, but we really don't shoot that often as professional mm-hmm. photographers. It's like, I think I've done one sheet this year and that that's quite standard. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> I was going to say, well, times are a little bit different at the moment, aren't they? But um, if, that's, yeah, if that's the norm, then... It's then, pretty yeah. normal for me. Like one shoot in January is pretty pretty standard um so yeah by the time we come around to doing stuff we often forget how to do it <laughs> again and uh yeah we, we don't remember everything it's a it's a common myth <laughs> i love it that's brilliant um, we've got more questions which i don't know if you're going to show this as we go through how do you calibrate your monitor What's that is the hard? next bit we're getting on to so don't worry <laughs> and do you calibrate your camera before each session before each job if it's a commercial job, we always use the uh, the swatch um, every single time, just because yeah. yeah, to calibrate the the raw file or, or to allow us to calibrate the raw file. So you, your camera captures what it does. So mm-hmm. this is what my camera's captured, and then we'll go through the process of setting the black point, white point, grey point, yeah. and then getting this raw file having a profile within Lightroom over here, and then selecting that profile, and we'll do it for every single shot we take. Because when it's commercial work and they're paying tens of thousands, you need to make sure that it is yeah. exactly correct. Exactly. And we have had problems in the past with some smaller clients where they've turned around and gone, the colours aren't right. And we've had to be able to turn around back and go, they are. Yeah. You just don't like them. We can yeah. change them, yeah. but they are accurate. Yeah. Um, so that happened a few times early doors. But uh, it's nice to know that when you're delivering to a client, you can go, they're accurate. What are you looking at them on? When they say, oh, I'm looking at it on my laptop, for example, mm-hmm. um, you're like, well, you need to come look at it on my monitor because yeah, mine's calibrated. Yeah. Yours probably yeah. isn't. Mm. Um, and even these, I've got a BenQ, which claims it's calibrated out of the box. It isn't. No. Um, when, I, when I recalibrated, it was miles off. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's worth doing those sorts of things. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I think then we've covered because I'm, I'm sounding a bit hesitant because i'm looking at questions in question and answer and i've got them in chat as well but i think we've covered everything <laughs> awesome i will carry on then i'll let you carry on yes and i'll catch up with these so back to you super so i we're back on the swatch here now what this has allowed us to do at this stage is get the raw file perfectly calibrated however i can guarantee you that all of us right now are seeing a completely different image um some of you will be on phones ipad your screen brightness will be all over the place and the calibration of your screen will be all over the place um which is where one having a good monitor is important and two having a calibrated monitor is important 
Uh, let me just turn my camera back on so I can show you a little doodle I have. There we go, that's good. Um, so what I have here is this, which is, I believe, potentially what you're giving away at the end of the session. I might be wrong, so don't... don't, don't, don't we are. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so these, these are the monitor calibrators. Um, and what it is, there's like a lens on the inside here, and you dangle it over your monitor like this in a special way, and it runs a calibration bit of software that I'll show you. And this here is the next bit of the process. This is going, right, we've got the camera file with the correct color profile. And this here allows me to see that color profile correctly. So it's a bit of a, you, you need both, I guess. Um, if you're just doing shooting for packaging, you don't actually have to know that it's looking right because you've got the thing. But if you're doing anything vaguely creative, then doing this is very important because you need to know that what you're looking at is correct. And I'd be certain that most of you have your screens turned on too bright um, because every time I calibrate my monitor, I realize that I've turned my screen brightness up again. And I've got a reasonably good BenQ monitor and it's sort of a, a 2K panel has a really good color range and it it was, it was supposed to be calibrated out of the box but it really wasn't when i recalibrated it with one of these it was completely different now i've got the i think it's an elite version of this which lets you do some other stuff with print as well which i'll show you at the end um but this here is something that you should use all the time and i'm going to show you the software as well in a moment but basically the way it goes is i come into the studio before anybody else does on a shoot day I turn on the heating, turn on the lights, turn on all of the computers in here, and I make coffee and sit down and drink in silence for half an hour because you need to let your monitors warm up. Um, you'll also, I don't think, can I wiggle this into a shot? Probably not. Oh, there we go. This here is a, a big hood around my monitor to stop glare on the screen, and then I call the light to these weird BenQ E lights so they don't cast glare on your screen as well. Um, so once they've heated the screens up, you need to get them in a good lighting scenario, which is what I sort of built in here. And then you can calibrate your monitor with this. Now, this also lets you do something where you can calibrate all of your monitors to match. So you might have three different monitors in a studio from different brands or different models, different years. And this will help keep those all consistent and give them continuity. So let me quickly try and do screen show again without breaking my computer. And then see, here we go. Let me find. Now, I'm not going to do the calibration software um, because all you're going to see is my screen flashing different colors and you won't be able to see anything else because it won't be a new screen for you. But this is the calibration device. I'm just going to go through some of these steps to sort of show you how it works. Now, I've been calibrating monitors for years and I've had the previous two generations of the Spider X stuff as well. Um, now, I got given this one, I'll uh, just be completely transparent, um, but I paid for the previous versions I had. So when they offered me a free one, I was obviously very happy. Um, but here we go. So you have to warm up your monitor, make sure your lighting conditions are okay, get your display set to a certain way, and then you have to plug this in via a USB port. It's pretty pretty simple. Uh, big tip would be, though, when you do put it on your screen, don't press it down into the screen. You can really mess up a monitor doing that. And you have to select the type of backlighting your monitor has, and it gives you a few examples of what you might have here. I'll just go for general for now. Okay, and then we've got the different, we've got the step-by-step, -step, the studio match, where you can get all your monitors to look very good. Um, and then this is just a bit of a, an extra techiness that you need to go through. Now, in here, we have a recalibration, a check calibration, and a full calibration. I never recalibrate and I never check calibration because by the time you've checked it or recalibrated, you might as well have done a full calibration. Um, they're so quick. They used to take like 45 minutes to do. But this is like, it takes five minutes now, I guess. Um, then you need to choose your gamma. Now, leave it on 2.2 unless you know there's a specific reason why you shouldn't. Um, like, same with brightness. This is how many candles you've got. Um, and then your white point at 6,500. Again, you can change it. And there are times when you will need to change it. But if you do need to change away from any of these recommended settings, you will know about it. It's not the sort of thing where you'll go, oh, I wonder whether I need that. You'll know if you need something else. Um, yep. Okay, now it's telling us to adjust these bits in here. I'm not going to do this because it's really boring, but we'll get to the uh, the bit. So this is where you put your spider thing onto the screen. And my hood has this weird little hole in it where you sort of filter it down, then tilt your monitor back so it rests on it. And you have to unclasp the device as well, which it shows you on the right-hand side there, and dangle it over. 
all you do then is hit next and you have to do a few adjustments, but it tells you what to do, putting your monitor brightness up, down, and in the middle. And by the end of it, you come out with a perfectly calibrated monitor. This should be done very often. There's a bit at the end where it tells you how often to remind you. You want to set the reminders onto never because they'll really bug you if, like me, you don't shoot that often. I end up getting a reminder every other day going, you need to calibrate your monitor. And it's like, I need to do it on shoot days or edit days. Um, but if ever, ever I'm shooting or if ever I'm editing or building a portfolio or putting anything together for print or like some e-shots or anything, I always make sure I've calibrated my monitor before I start, just in case I picked up a file that's a little bit off or the export's gone a bit wrong or the TIFF file that I've created has got a bit of a weird color cast or whatever it may be. Sometimes when you export stuff over and over, it, it doesn't like it, even if you're doing it as the same file. But this is how we sort of calibrate the monitor. Given if I was going to choose the most important aspect out of calibrating the monitor and calibrating your camera, I'd say calibrate your monitor for most people because at least you know that what you're seeing is correct. Whereas with this, it'll give you the perfect raw file, but if you want to get creative and do some weird stuff to colors, it makes it a little bit different with the swatches. I just realized you can't see both screens at the moment. But yes, yeah, so if you've got the swatch, it's good to get 100% accuracy, but if you want to really get creative with your work, you're probably going to want to prioritize getting something like a screen calibrator. Um, let's just go back to here. Do we have any questions at this point about the screen calibration? Before we, uh, on? we have. We do, yes. Um, what do you have in mind when choosing a monitor? Price. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, so I get, I, I get asked this a lot. It's like, oh, what, what camera should I get? What? It's like, whatever you can afford, buy that. Yeah, um, best of what you can afford. Yeah, pretty much. I have used several different, so like I have my own studio, which we shoot from, um, and I've got all BenQ stuff in here predominantly because BenQ sent me loads of stuff. Um, <laughs> and that that was the cheapest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> um, I quite like the BenQ stuff. I've, I've had really expensive monitors on one shoot where we shot in this nice place in London. Mm -hmm. And I remember them telling me it's like the monitor cost 7,000. <gasps> I couldn't tell the difference if I'm know. honest. Maybe I could have felt side by side, but yeah. I couldn't tell the, the yeah. difference between them. Wow. Um, and you know, it, it depends, you know, my printing people who are printing my books at the moment, my portfolio books, they have really good monitors and they really understand colour, but they see more than I see. Mm -hmm. um, I see the photograph, they see the colours. Mm -hmm. um, much like with my retoucher, he will see all these little bits and pieces that I don't even notice. Mm. Um, but he makes sure they're all smart and nice for everyone else. But yeah. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I would always just go, my budget is this, what is the best monitor I can afford? Yeah, I don't think you need a 4K monitor or anything like that. I don't own a 4K monitor. Um, whenever I've looked at 4K stuff, I, I can't see the difference. No. Um, maybe it's just my eyesight, but... Yeah, I'd, I'd always just go, what, what's my budget? How much money do I have for this? Mm -hmm. And go for the best you can afford. BenQ is good. Um, I've always liked them. I've always yeah. been happy with them. They're yeah. pretty well made, all pretty heavy and sturdy bases. Yeah. Um, and they're reasonably priced. I think you can get like a decent yeah. BenQ monitor for about £700. Yeah, yeah, um, we we get um, we get this question coming up quite a lot within the, within the Guild. Um, a lot of people vote for BenQ rather as um as because the question is usually should I go BenQ or should I fork out and get an apple but generally BenQ wins yes time. well I've got all my computers are apple um so I've got like the retina display macbooks and stuff like that and they look beautiful they look better than the BenQ yeah. but yeah. the BenQ looks closer to print yeah yeah um uh, yeah but yeah I think it's I, I, I'd rather watch a film on a, a Mac screen, but I'd rather yeah. edit my pictures on a BenQ. Yeah, totally get that. Um, okay, do you always rely on what's on your computer monitor or do you also use your phone as most images are viewed on a handheld device? I always check on my phone. Mm. Um, I've got a, an iPhone something. I don't know what it is. One of the big <laughs> ones where it like fills your whole hand and you look a bit like Don Jolly when you're phoning people. <laughs> um, but yeah, I always bang it onto Dropbox at a web res export and then open it up on here yeah. on my phone just to make sure that it sort of looks good on Instagram because that's what matters. Yeah, it's yeah, it. definitely. <laughs> it's where most of my work ends up, sadly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, where, it's where everybody is nowadays, isn't it? And that's where you've got to be really, isn't it? Yeah, I, I get so much work through Instagram. Um, God, God. When everyone's on their lunch break or commuting to the ad agencies, they're on Instagram. Yeah. It's like the best place to subtly market to people. Yes, exactly that, exactly that. Um, 
This is in re- uh, this question is in regard to the monitor brightness. I have an option to manually control my monitor brightness, or should I use the auto setting? Uh, don't use the auto setting. Uh, <laughs> so, have I got my camera on still? Yes. There's like a little sensor on here. If you leave this plugged in and pop it down on your desk, it'll measure the room brightness and it will keep adjusting your monitor automatically. Wow. It drives me mental because you pick your phone up, my phone's on those charging pads, the screen goes on, it shines on it, and your monitor suddenly drops. Oh, gosh, yeah. (laughs) The cloud goes past the window for five seconds, or my white cat sits on it, and it's like, (laughs) it hasn't got a clue what's going on. So, yeah, I just leave it on standard. Um, And I I turn anything automatic Mm -hmm. on anything, turn off, because it always causes problems. Yeah, Um, I totally agree. And I'd also recommend the first time you calibrate your screen, if you've never done it before, do it twice. Because the first time you do it, you'll go, that's not right. It looks blue or it looks yellow because you've been so used to looking at the wrong thing. Yeah. So it's always worth doing it twice because if you do leave a slight gap between the calibration tool and the monitor when you like put a bit on there, some yeah. light could leak in or, you know, there's a bit of user error involved. Yeah. Um, but when I first calibrated my first monitor, I suddenly had to go and re-edit loads of images. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they were so far off. Um, Did you yeah. find that the, the calibrator tends to warm your screen up rather than cool it down i would say mine always looks cooler than what i expect it to look like oh okay um but that could just be because i look at an iphone all day which is very warm and very saturated and very bright yeah um so compared to that it comes up quite matte yeah contrast on the blue side although it is actually perfectly in the middle it feels blue it's all relative colors are yeah um there's like little things like if you drink too many coffees before you edit the colors look different really yeah yeah, there's a lot like sleep deprivation is a huge one with editing which is why whenever we have overnight deliveries my retoucher edits overnight and i check at six in the morning to check his colors yeah to then report back in case he's seen something different because he's been up all night editing yeah wow that's uh, we learn something new every day guys um jimmy is asking what bank you monitor that you use what do you think about iso i thought that iso is industry standard um it probably is uh they have them at a lot of studios that we mm. rent um and again i just can't tell the difference no um I'm sure they're better and more accurate and more consistent. They might be better over a long period. So I've only had the Benkey monitors for like three years. Mm-hmm. Um, but like with lighting, for example, I had a Godox light, which lasted about a year and a half. But then I've got some like 35-year-old Broncolor lights that are still running strong. Mm-hmm. So it might be a case that you pay more money up front for the ISO monitors, but then 10 years later, you're still using the same monitor because it just yeah. it doesn't lose all the... Like, I know with the BenQ one I've got now, it's already lost a few of its brightness points. Uh, so yeah. a lot of the time when you spend more money, it's not necessarily better kit. It's often just more reliable yeah. uh, and a longer lifespan. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. But I, I just couldn't justify the price of them, to be honest. No. It's like- no. <laughs> I think many people will relate to, especially now. <laughs> Uh, we've got any suggestions on calibration if you're working in an office with natural light during the day or arti- and artificial light at night would it be better to wait until night time to calibrate in that situation let me just see if i've got something to show you wait there have i got it in here i have two secs okay whilst scott's gone we can admire moggy guys can't we Oh, she heard us. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm back. I'm back. Brilliant. I'm probably going to pounce me when I do this. Now, this is for a <laughs> laptop and it makes me look absolutely insane, but I have sat on the train. Back oh, my gosh. With this on the table. And then there's like a sheet here which goes over your head. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> so I go inside here like this and I'm doing oh my, my on the way home on the train. And I can only imagine what people think I'm trying to hide. Yeah. From. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh so you can, you can get all sorts of shades and things like that to sort of help i always think editing at night feels better because you get more contrast on your screen yeah. um i've recently painted all the walls in my studio behind the monitor a dark gray for that reason because they're white yeah. before yeah um but then by nighttime you're normally quite tired so maybe the daytime's better yeah. in those regards yeah depends on the person i suppose <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm definitely not a night owl i'm more of a morning person Yes, much the same here, much the same here. Um, Mark's put, that's great for social distancing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think they're cool. Oh, they're from Think Tank. I'm sure other brands make them as well. 
Um, but they're great when you're shooting on location and you need to see your screen when you're tethering and like the sun's like going across your Mac and you can't see anything. Yeah. Um, is it pointless calibrating your screen if you don't do your camera as well, or is it worth cal- or is it still worth calibrating your screen? I'd say it's more more worth calibrating your screen than your camera, because um, yeah. if you calibrate your camera. <sighs> It's a bit chicken and egg. It depends on what you're doing. Um, If I was shooting weddings, I'd prioritise calibrating my screen because the lighting will change so much throughout the day. As all the lenses, the cameras and all the rest of it. Um, When I used to shoot weddings, I had a 35mm Sigma lens on one camera Mm -hmm. and then a matching camera but with an 85mm Canon lens and the colours and exposures were completely different despite the settings being identical. Yeah. Um, So the test test chart would fix that but the chances of you remembering every few minutes to get one of these out and get someone to hold it and go, can we just get a shot of that? And then yeah. it's probably not going to happen. So it really depends on what you're doing. Um, but I'd probably calibrate my monitor as a, a given, like a, a, you know, if you really need to do both, to be honest. Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know how much these things <laughs> cost. For honest, do yeah, both. yeah. I think like, <laughs> I think my calibration for my monitor, the old ones cost me like 250 pounds each or something like that. Um, and I think these things here are like a hundred pounds each or somewhere yeah. Yeah. in that ballpark. I know that the first calibration tool I bought felt really expensive at 250 pounds. So I didn't really know what it was doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I kept hearing people talking about it. So I bought one, yeah. which is a really stupid <laughs> reason to buy something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm quite susceptible like that. Someone goes, oh yeah, you need one of these uh, back in the day. I'll, I'll, I'll buy one of those. Yeah. <laughs> I've got no idea what it does. No, my life um, is missing exactly that until you yes. say <laughs> um but yeah I, i'd say in ter- like photography is a tricky one because there's so many components to photography mm, it's like yeah. i'm sat on a desk right now with two benq monitors about 30 terabytes of working hard drives and this isn't even my archive this is just like stuff on the go at the moment yeah. um and it's just it's an expensive kit everywhere and it's always yeah. a thing i was like well do i buy a monitor do i buy a new wacom tablet do i buy a new light what's going to make the biggest difference mm. um and I'd say I'd spend more money on my monitor and calibration than my computer for stills. Yeah. Um, but then at the end of the day, you need a good camera, good lens and a good light. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit of a, it's yeah. always, there's too many things to spend money on. Yeah. Um, it's an and expensive then, business this one is. But it is. And before you know it, you have all the it. things, but they're devaluing really quickly. Yeah. Uh, so it's like you just see money leaving Constantly out. Constantly one more. Yeah. Oh, no. Um. What is the difference between studio calibration and normal calibration? Ah, studio calibration is, let me just open up to make sure I'm reading about the right thing here, is where you match all of your monitors in the studio. Mm-hmm. So I've got a, you can't see my screen at the moment, but um, there we go. Yes, yeah, so it's called studio match. Um, we've used it a few times, but again, to be honest, I'm quite lazy. And sometimes for me, it's quicker to just calibrate the tether machine and then calibrate the editing machine later. Mm-hmm. Um, because if I had all matching monitors throughout the studio, I might do this. Um, but for me personally, it's just it, it's just as easy to plug in. I've got several calibration tools as well. So there's one for each machine. Mm-hmm. So I just leave them plugged in all the time and just calibrate and leave them all running, I guess. But that's me yeah. being lazy. Um <laughs> I mean, the studio match is only as good as your matching monitors, I suppose. Like you can, you can match three really good monitors from different brands quite well. But if you've got like a cheap monitor, a good monitor, and an average monitor, getting them all to match in perfectly is going to be a tall order. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got what is the best monitor for photo editing? Gloss or not gloss? I didn't know there was any difference. So, I, I guess the the Apple screens are quite glossy. They're sort of like the Retina. I see. Is. Yes. Um, yeah. Whereas the BenQ ones very matte. Yeah. If you're shooting for a hobby, I'd go for the super glossy mm-hmm. Apple monitors because they look great. Yeah. Um, but if you want it to print well, I would go for the matte sort of looking ones. It's not as fun to look at, but you you get a more accurate result. Yeah. Yeah. The questions just keep rolling in, so I don't know if you want to carry on with. Um, yeah, if I do the next bit of the sort of, yeah. the, the, the final bit's quite short. Um, We've got so many questions. They just keep coming in. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then we'll uh, plow through. We aren't short, yeah. don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Super. Let me just find my uh, screen share button. I'm still getting used to Zoom. It's not my uh, strong point. There we go. Oh, what, what, what have you found that you've been um, doing this on? More so. 
Um, I, I just don't talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> Most just by myself. I, I, it's, uh, lockdown's not been very hard for me. No. <laughs> uh, my life hasn't really changed that much. Oh, uh, that's brilliant. Absolutely. So this is, now I didn't know about this, this is really ignorant of me, um, but I was fortunate enough to be able to speak to one of the guys over at Data Color because... Well, I wanted to, I guess. I, don't know. I, I just thought, I, I just, you know, just go, I've been doing this for years. I should really double check that I'm doing it right before I tell other people about it. Because if <laughs> I've been doing it wrong for the last 10 years, that'll be embarrassing. Um, turns out I was doing it okay. Oh, God. Um, but there's something I just didn't know about, which is soft proofing. So as well as calibrating your monitor, now this is really useful. And this is now something I'm going to be using a lot. This here will show you what you're going to print. So I'm just going to add an image into here to sort of give you a bit of a, a rough guide of things. What have we got kicking around that might be a useful file for this? That will do it. There we go. So here is my image. Um, can you all see that okay? Or does it come out? Um, we can't see it's the image. the window. It's Wait, there. It's going to pop up outside of that one. Um, let's stop share and try share again. But I'll share my entire screen if I can. Yes, you should be able to. Should give you that option. Bear with me. This is my uh, IT skills. There we go. Here we go. So here's my image. Um, and this is what it looks like on my screen. You'll be seeing whatever your screen's version of this is. Now, what I'm going to go here is in profiles. I'm just going to go to printer profiles. And what I can do now is select... I'm going to print it in a newspaper on this particular stock. Um, so we'll go for a newspaper print. And if we hit the preview button, that's what it will look like printed on newspaper paper. And if we hit the gamut warning, that'll show us how many of these colors are going to be guessed by the paper. Because let's try a different one here. And you can see how different it is from different papers and what it's going to look like depending on what you're printing it with. And you can add in your OC. So if you speak to your printer, they can give you their profile. So before you go to print, you can check what your image is going to come out like compared to what you see it on the screen um, because there is a huge, huge difference in there. Mm -hmm. You can also do, let's go to tablet. So we've got iPad 3 in here. We can also check what it's going to look like on an iPad compared to this screen um, and where the iPad is going to make up colors because it doesn't actually own those colors within its own physical location. So this is like an extra useful bit which is particularly good for anybody who prints work or publishes anywhere just to make sure your edits are okay um because we'll often have to re-edit for different things so if we're doing a shoot and it's going to billboard and it's also going to point of sale and it's going to be used in part with some of the assets being cut out onto social media we'll grade those in three different ways to make sure they match i was doing it in a really convoluted way in photoshop but it turns out you can just pop it in here and have a look um, which is much better than the way I was doing it. So just a bit of a, a recap, really, um, if I stop sharing this. So in terms of like getting your colors correct, um, having correct colors isn't a necessity, but having them is a good starting point, I guess. So in terms of getting making sure the lens is, you're getting a good aperture out of it and that you've taken a few frames to make sure that that one's right. Obviously, if you're shooting the 100 meter final, at the Olympics, you're not going to get a few frames of each shot. You just have to go with what you get. The more wide open your lens is, the more accurate it is. So completely wide open, the blades don't move. Uh, you stop down to 2.8, they move a little bit. But by F10, F13, which is where most of my images are, those blades have to move a real long way, especially on a 100mm lens. So you're more likely to get those inconsistencies. Anyone who's ever shot a time lapse at anything apart from wide open will know this. Um, the only real way around that is to drop your shutter speed to below a 30th of a second. That seems to fix the issue for some unknown reason um but yeah making sure you've got that good exposure first that your light that you use are uh, consistent in color temperature that's really important you do pay a premium for that but then for any of the big shoots we do we rent the really expensive lights because i can't afford ten thousand pound packs and sort of three grand a head um so once you've got your camera set up right and your lighting set up right you then want to be using one of these color checkers where you've got your little passport of images all the different colors. And this is where you get your raw file to have the correct colors in it. Now that's not to say that you have to leave them there. You can change those correct colors to be whatever colors you want. 
but sometimes you need to have them exactly correct. And sometimes it's just good to start off in this ballpark and then do what you want to it afterwards. Um, and likewise, if using multiple lenses or different camera models, different camera brands on the same job, it's a real good way to calibrate all of them. So you get all your different shooters to take this image at the start, and then you can get that color spacing correct. Then once you've got it into your editing software, all you need to do then is sort of make sure that you've got the right calibration of the monitor so that when I look at this here, theoretically, all of us should be able to see the same colors. But what's happening at the moment, unless you've all calibrated your monitor at exactly the same time, is that we're all seeing completely different colors. And you'd be amazed at how different it is. I thought I was going to be able to calibrate my monitor and show you the before and after, um, but I was told by the clever people at Data Color that it doesn't work like that and you'll just see the same screen flicking back and forth. Um, but yes, it, it makes a big difference. So you've got this, you've got your calibration of that, and then you've got your testing before publication which is what you do in the spider software to see what paper stock, what ink stock you're going to use and how that might affect things. And that's kind of the process I go through. It sounds a bit convoluted, but once you sort of put it in action, it's pretty straightforward. I wouldn't want to test it out at a wedding or any high stress sort of event, but I sit in a warehouse all day with a cat. Um, so it, it's quite easy to do that. Um, and just, it saves me so much time. It also gives me that confidence as well. Because often by the time we're on like re-edit 50 or something for a client, you've forgotten what the item of food you're photographing even looked like. So it's good to have this sort of in the bank to go, ah, do you know what? I think I've gone too far with my colors. Let's move back. We'll start again and then get the good calibration in there. So we've got a good starting point. How was that in terms of Fabulous. Colors? Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> does that cover most it's really weird talking to nobody especially with headphones on i've got no idea if anyone's like walking behind me or anything <laughs> no i was sure you nobody has walked in. it's only marky who's with you and there are 124 people watching so oh, lovely plenty 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 people which is why we've got hundreds and hundreds of questions <laughs> i'll try and go through some of those <laughs> we've got 43 at the moment which keeps jumping up so i think you may the, the soft proofing may have covered this one, but how do you colour correct for billboard, print and iPad? Is there a way to calibrate for each one? Yes, that, that's in the proof. So you calibrate your monitor as its own thing, regardless mm -hmm. of where it's ending up. The monitor you're looking at is what you're calibrating. But then what you want to see is it's called soft proofing, so it's your output. So that's where I think it's only in the elite version of the data colour where you get that. Mm -hmm. Um I think I'd have, have to you um, have you had the elite ones previously or have you been in the X range I have had all of them at some point oh, bear with okay. me let me have a look I've got all the software on my computer because because I'm lazy they're just sort of <laughs> <laughs> now I've had all of them at some point everything from the spider 5 pro onwards um, okay so would you say that there's any difference between them because i know we've got a few people that are watching that are using the elite and wondering if there's any difference i yeah the elite has a far more robust calibration you'll get a more accurate calibration from the elite mm -hmm. um, and you also get the soft proofing which is pretty mm -hmm. useful and you get the multiple monitor calibration if you need to get a whole suite of computers matching which i, I guess not many people have unless they own a design agency um or like me you just hoard computers everywhere <laughs> so I, i'm not sure what the price difference is um mm. let me have a look i should know these things it's not that i'm blase <laughs> about money it's just that i've not bought one for a while um we have had a question as well um asking although you were given these ones um have you found that have, have you used any of this other than data color no um and I actually bought them before I got given them. So I, I got given this, one. this exact one. Yeah. Be different I got given. Uh, but I bought loads of them in the past as well. Yeah. Um, I've also used the x right mm -hmm. in the past for the color swatch. Mm -hmm. But it's really small. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's about yay big. Oh, Where gosh. Is. Where is that? It's a really good size. Yeah. Yeah. Which, it, it doesn't always matter, but it's always better to have more than less. Oh, um, yeah. I find so. Oh, it's two hundred and fifty pounds for the elite ish, and one hundred and seventy five for the. Oh no, that's the same one. I'm just googling it quickly to find out how much it is. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's worth two hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah, um, especially as it's the sort of thing that you buy once and you're good. They don't really wear out. Um, I have lost a few and I've sat on one, but they don't. <laughs> they don't tend to. I've never had one like break, as it were. 
Brilliant, brilliant. So we are full recommending data colour, which is what we are here to do as well. Because if you are a guild member, you get a um, you get fabulous um, benefits with them. Ah, that's good. Yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely one. I mean, I think uh, there's a, there's a more advanced version of colour accuracy that you can go for mm. than this sort of setup. But the price is astronomical, like thousands mm. and thousands. Um, and we've used them before on a particular shoot and we had to rent them in and then we had to also rent in a person who knew how to use it oh, uh, because it was so complex oh, I couldn't God. tell the difference oh. like, like the person cost more than a full data colour system oh, um, and it, but like it's what the client wanted so mm. they got um, but I, I couldn't tell any difference it was just really painfully slow to sort out whereas this like yeah. at the price point is pretty good yeah but, I don't know what else I'd buy for the same price unless I was going to spend thousands and thousands and have somebody follow me around to make it work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like, and, and a lot of it comes down to like, you know, return on investment in professional Yeah, form. absolutely, of course. Um, Susan's asking, is the soft proofing available on all Spider products? No, I think it's only on the Elite version, but let me find out because I've actually got different versions of the software on here. Uh, Spider 5 Pro. Oh, good question. Um, Phil's asking, is it not better for the printer to proof the final print so they can then take final responsibility for the end product? But I suppose it's best for you to give them as perfect as possible as you can give them a file. And then... It depends on who's printing. Mm. Um, if I was getting my local print lab to do it, I would make sure it was right and I wouldn't trust them. Mm. Um, I wouldn't let like a Jessup's sort of camera store choose the printing for me um the printers i'm using at the moment for some work i'm doing i let them have my raw files with the edit so they can adjust it to make it work best with their yeah. stock yeah um, they're a professional printing lab yeah i mean like, supposed the, the, to walking into your local jessops yeah the, the price is astronomical <laughs> <It's> like, <Yeah. laughs> when they first quoted me i thought they were quoting for the whole lot not per page and I was, <laughs> It was a bit of a, an eye-watering experience. Oh, but then when yeah. I saw the prints, I was like, this looks so much better in print than it does on my screen. Mm. Um, okay. And they will fine-tune everything to make it look exactly yeah. right. And they'll also tell you when you've made mistakes in your editing. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, <laughs> they'll be like, you don't want it like this, mate. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's one of the big things that a lot of people in photography don't really think of, that when you start out, you do the the planning, the editing, the shooting, the whole thing all by yourself you might even have a printer in your studio to print from mm. but after a while we start to bring other people in to do stuff for you so mm -hmm. on a big shoot nowadays we'll have a producer my agent the retoucher the digital tech the lighting assistant mm -hmm. the assistant moggy the cat and yeah, then you know so stylist to. styling assistant it, it gets quite big and then down to the more sort of like smaller shoots yeah. going to be myself an assistant and a stylist but even then like there'll be someone doing the retouching and there'll be everyone's just responsible for a very small amount of the job yeah. um they're very good at what area they do yeah but what happens then is that when they all disappear so we have to do some shoots over lockdown which were quite big with a very skeleton crew mm. none of us knew what we're doing um because once you don't do it every day you forget about it very quickly yeah yeah um, so i often get asked how to do certain things and i'm like no nah, i kind of know but i haven't done it for a while it's <laughs> yeah. uh like if somebody asks you to do a tie to tie somebody else's tie and you think oh yes yeah it's like um, well, i can do it if you give it to me and i close yeah, my eyes, yeah. but it's, uh... <laughs> um so what do we have we have one very important question any suggestions on dealing with computer computer fans sucking up cat hair <laughs> so th this is don't do this but what i do is i turn it off and i get a hoover and i hoover the fans oh my god i've got, uh, I've got one of those little handheld hoovers at the back of the yeah. studio i also make loads of mess making coffee when i grind the coffee it goes everywhere with static <laughs> and i don't even see like moggy's cat hair's literally just floating into the air in the background um <laughs> but yeah i just hoover everything um Every but then I, I buy all of my ca uh, computers secondhand um, so I don't have to pay too much for them, I guess. Mm. Then I don't really worry so much if they break yeah. or if I break them more to the point. Oh, if Moggy breaks them. Or if Moggy breaks them. Yeah. She, she did vomit into my brand new £150 keyboard yesterday. Oh, God. Um, I had to deconstruct it, take the internal battery out of it so I could clean it without shorting it. Oh, that, God. That was, that was a nice treat. Oh, <laughs> 
they say are wonderful, but when they give you presents like that, it's yeah. they're oh. questionable at times. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, would you try and overcompensate on your editing depending where your image is going to be printed? Yes. Um, so when I put an image onto Instagram, mm-hmm. for example, I'll, I'll edit the image. Say it's just a test shoot. I'll edit it once, for example. Mm-hmm. And then when I go onto Instagram, let me find out what the actual filter is called. I select my image, go to next, go to edit. And then there's a slider called structure. Mm-hmm. And I bang that up to about 50% on every single image um, because it's such a small screen. It's such a small image that it just needs that extra bit of pop just to make it stand out. Whereas if you're printing it huge, you don't need that because it mm-hmm. being huge is that extra bit of pop. Yeah. yeah. You also sharpen it slightly differently sometimes. But the, I think the thing to remember is that we're photographers and we're hypercritical. Yeah, absolutely. Most viewers just don't care. Like they, <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't care. Yeah, you need to just, you it know, is true. <laughs> if there's a picture and there's a cat in it, you're sorted. Um, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. It doesn't definitely. matter how accurate anything is or how well edited it is as long as it's got a cat. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, we've got, would different screen resolutions affect the colour calibration? And if so, what is the optimum screen resolution to use? Probably. Um, I don't know the exact answer to that. I recently tested out a BenQ 4K monitor um, next to my standard. I think it's like 1080p mine is. It's nothing fancy. Mm. Um, and I couldn't tell the difference. So I, I sent the 4K one back um so i don't know i guess it depends on what you're doing uh, mm-hmm. and what you see um because yeah. some people swear blind they can tell the difference and i just can't tell the difference between 4k 2k 1080 mm. it all looks the same to me yeah when i'm editing 4k footage i can tell the difference when i zoom in mm-hmm. um, and if i want to crop in tight and do like a punch in or something but it's like the same with like most of my images are shot between 50 and 100 megapixels but if i shot them at 10 i don't think you'd know the difference and i think it's worth relating that to viewing them as well um so i view 50 megapixel my basic camera is 50 megapixels Mm -hmm. so that's like the smallest resolution i look at on here and even on the 4k screen i couldn't see any difference in it no and that's a lot of pixels that you're um looking at there isn't it so yeah i mean you can zoom in for like miles on it yeah you print it it looks the same as any other file yeah. Um, but it is much easier with a high resolution file for retouching yeah when you're zooming in it's so much easier but then on the flip side of that is there's more retouching to do because it collects more information true very, so. true. <laughs> very true um do you ever print your work while you're editing to judge the colors and do you calibrate the printer no and the reason is because i did buy a printer again it's one of those things i bought and then returned um, and it was so expensive and it was really average. Um, so I think I spent like 900 pounds on a printer and like the set of ink was 250 pounds uh, and the prints were just really mediocre. Um, and I think unless you're printing regularly, mm. you've got a lot of money to throw out the problem. It's not really financially viable to do it. If I had money to burn, I'd definitely get a, I'd love to be able to do an edit and bang out a print and see how it looks and then yeah. calibrate the whole process myself. But yeah. It's an expensive know. deal. It's very expensive. And it's a lot, it's just an, an extra job. There's professional printers for a reason, I always think. So I yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why not take advantage? Um, we've got one from I'm not even gonna win, try and announce your name because I don't want to get it wrong and sound fool. So how do you match colour temperature from different lights and modifiers? I have brown colour lights, for example, but if I use a softbox on a light and another light with a grid. They have completely different colour temperatures. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this is a problem. Um, so a lot of the way that we would light a scene would be based around this. So if I pulled out like a five metre wide softbox and then had some super specular reflector on a separate light shooting the side of it, that specular reflector would look slightly blue compared to a slightly warmish tone of a, um, what's the name for it? Softbox, there we go. Mm. I do know I do know the things, you know, <laughs> the, the big things. Yeah, um, those big things that take yeah, up yeah. the <laughs> a lot of, light through them. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of the broncolor packs allow you to adjust the colours of each head independently. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, I can't remember the one we rent, Scoro, I think it's called. Scoro, something like that. 
you can't afford to buy them. Like no, no one should have enough money to buy Scorio packs. They're like ten thousand pound per pack. Um, oh. So we rent them, and even then, it's a little bit eye watering. Yeah, um, I just use really old packs, my like day to day stuff, and even they are a little bit eye wateringly expensive. Um, but yeah, you, you can adjust the white balance in there, and you can actually get. So I've got a light meter here. Um, you can get a color meter as well, which is mm-hmm. extortionately expensive. So you can actually meter the color and match it. Um, and you can rent those as well, actually. So I do rent that sort of stuff when I need to do okay. that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the type of work I do, although I own lots of lights and lots of modifiers, I light pretty much everything with either 1600 watts of light through a, a hazy light, it's called, um, or I use about 400 watts of light through what's called a soft lighter. Mm-hmm. Which is like a, a giant reflector with two layers of different diffusion within it. Um, that's pretty much the only two things I ever use. So I don't really come across that problem. But when we do really technical shoots, I do have to keep in mind that if we're using like eight different lights, even mm-hmm. if it's the same head on the same packs, different modifier can give you a slightly different color cast. Yeah. Um, and also the older the modifiers get, they, they lose their quality. So like soft boxes are not all made equally. So, you know, a, the hazy light that I've got is a particularly even homogenous softbox, even though it's hard. Um, mm-hmm. And that gives out really even, consistent light in terms of colour and spread. Um, whereas I've got a Godox softbox, which gives you all kinds of weird light, but sometimes that all kinds of weird light looks really good. Yeah. Um, but it gives you a completely different white balance to the hazy light. And then if you use a, a bronze colour softbox, that gives you a better white balance than the other ones. And then when I had Bowen's, there's the elite Bowens range and the standard Bowens range and the elite ones give a much more accurate color balance because of the way they've been built inside them. Um, so your lighting source has a lot to do with the colors. Um, but to get really good accuracy, you want to use the bronze color packs and the bronze color, I think they're called the F heads, F2 heads or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then you can dial in the white balance for every single light at its power. So if you have got a discrepancy due to modifiers, you can correct it within the pack for that specific head. Yeah. Um, but that's it obviously right. takes a lot of time and money. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> sometimes yeah. just I yeah. do many things. <laughs> yeah, you, do, you just get the brush out in a Lightroom and just brush in a slightly different <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> color balance in that area. Oh, Moggy's waking up. She's gonna oh, oh. <laughs> bless her. Um, we've still got so many questions, and we are already over time. So I don't know if um, we I save the questions and perhaps send them to you or are you happy to go through more i don't, I don't i'm know. good for another few minutes if you wanted to power for a few more questions yeah yeah okay um so um so many of them how long do you expect your laptop screen to or your um or your computer screen to last as a professional photographer without calibrating it i'm finding my screen has gone really dull after only two months of post-production i would calibrate it every time i edit on it um and i'd assume it'd work for a day laptops even less now the problem with the laptop is as you open the screen up at different angles Mm. everything changes yeah um so even with this like monitor i've got here i have to have it at the exact right height and my Mm. chair at the exact right height and the correct distance and i've also got some weird glasses uh, that my optician sorted out for me, um, which was specifically for when I edit. I have different oh, reading right. classes, but these are just for editing on. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's quite a few. Uh, I mean, I just always calibrate it every time I go to do work. Yeah, yeah, um, just some, to be on the safe side. Yeah, if we're shooting several days in a row, I still calibrate each day. Because if a computer, like the IMAX and things like that, where there's a lot of heat in the screen, mm-hmm. that that's going to affect the colour temperature no yeah. end throughout the course of a day. So I just every single day to recalibrate it and give it a fresh a yeah. fresh one as it were but then if i'm just browsing youtube i don't don't bother no no <laughs> is it advisable to have your ambient light turned off when cal- calibrating your monitor so i've had a play with this um i think i get better results with it turned off but you have to remember that it's a relative thing so without the distracting lights i if i was going to be editing right now i'd turn all the lights off in this room and i'd yeah. edit in pitch black because i prefer mm. it i don't know if it's better or not but i prefer it mm. um so but i think when you're calibrating it calibrate it in the scenario where you're going to edit yeah yeah so if i was going to edit in this lighting what i've got going on here i'd calibrate with it like this yeah um but normally when i'm editing it's pretty pitch black in here yeah 
would you create various versions of images based on the colour spaces? Say something, Instagram. Yes, you would, wouldn't you? We've answered something similar to that already. Yeah, if it's like colour profiles and colour spacing on your monitor, like um, sRGB and stuff like that, I tend not to change those. No. Um, unless, and it's one of those things, it's like they're there for a reason um, and you'll know when that reason is because someone will say, please, can we have it delivered in? And then yeah. you need to make sure your screen's in that colour space just so you've got yeah. the right colour space. Um, but I get asked that a lot, but yeah, I'll just leave it in the standard mm-hmm. colour spacing because that's what most people view in. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you got any tips for Mac users in particular with the colour calibrating? Um, now, I, I do own a PC, but I'm not particularly good with them. But in terms of the Mac stuff, your screen will always be too bright. Um, no matter it's like it's one of these no weird what things. you do I'm forever just like turning the brightness of my keyboard yeah. for my monitor I'm like let's have it a bit brighter a bit brighter and then you see your print and you realise your whole image is underexposed yeah. Um, but yeah it's definitely worth regularly calibrating because part of the calibration as well as getting the colours right and the white balance right yeah. is making yeah, sure that your important. screen brightness is correct mm-hmm. um, because you obviously can't set your exposure if you don't know what your screen no. brightness is uh, apart from using a histogram but um, histograms aren't useful that often no. In your opinion, the brightness of your screen, does it feel, because as photographers, we're looking at screens all the time. Um, do you find that you tend to turn it down or up? Or definitely, when, definitely up. Definitely up. Um, which, um, well, I don't on my editing screen anymore. This is, It always looks too dark when I'm editing because this is correct. Mm. Um, mm. But like when I'm on my laptop at home, just sort of like browsing the internet. Mm. And even on my phone, I have it on full brightness yeah. all the time. Um but then I can't see in the dark very well, so maybe that's why. I'm notoriously <laughs> blind in the dark. As soon as it gets a little bit dark, I just I'd bump into everything. Um, so it might just be personal preference. Yeah, yeah, perhaps it is then, yeah. Um, what colour space do you retouch in? Um, hang on, let me tell you. I'm going to have to press my monitor button to tell you exactly. So I can never quite remember. So I have it all matched up. Um it's sRGB. Now, there is an Adobe RGB as well, which we do sometimes use for certain jobs. Um, but I get told when I need that. Um, but I was told that sRGB is the best to use for like 99.9% of your work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, in a photo shoot, a calibrated monitor would be as trustworthy as your camera meter. Ooh, so that's a good question. Mm. We do it in a few ways. So we meter the light. Generally speaking, I'll tell my assistant what the shot needs to look like and how we're lighting it and where the light fall off should be. So I might say, well, top of the frame needs to be at F10, bottom of the frame needs to be at F8. Um, And we're using it with this light from this angle. So they'll set that up and meter it. But then when we take the shot, what we see on screen is what we believe to be right. Um, and then when we do the edit, what we see on print is what we believe to be right. Yeah. Um, so we'd always, it's the same with um, when you shot film, you'd meter the scene and it might say, oh, it's F10, 125th of a second. You mm-hmm. take your Polaroid. If your Polaroid says something different, you trust the Polaroid. You don't trust the light meter. Mm-hmm. Um, because as well as the light meter being accurate as a light meter, the camera's got so many other things that are going to affect it. And especially if you start using things like bellows and things like that and movements and lenses. It throws it all over the place. Yeah, I'll always go off a calibrated screen for correct exposure rather than anything a camera says. Mm-hmm. Um, in regards to the brightness again, what brightness should a screen be set up for calibrating or is that different on the area that you're working in, would you say? So the, the brightness should always be the same. Um, mm-hmm. And when you go through the calibration software, the first screen you come up with is a thing where you have to get this little dial to sit between two points, which is the right yeah. brightness for your screen. Um, and it, whenever you do it, you'll go, that's too dark. And then mm. you get used to it and you go, oh, no, that, that, that is correct. Yeah. Um, so I think most of us are used to having like bright screens, like televisions and stuff blaring at us and phones like really like illuminating our faces. And then when you calibrate something to look proper for print, it seems really drab almost. Yeah. Um, but it definitely produces better images because of that. Like if I'm editing on a a retina screen everything looks great but if you're yeah. editing on a screen where it's all quite flat mm. to make it look great you have to really work in the edit and that then gives you a much much better print yeah much richer one brilliant are you still okay for time or yeah yeah I've, 
It's a very cheek of me. I've got renders running in the background. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we're keeping you busy whilst you keep. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, will this work on any laptop or does it need a minimum spec graphics card? Oh, I don't know about graphics card, but you do need a minimum spec monitor, um, which it does have on their website. Now, these things, don't. when I read it, I was like, I don't know what that means. Mm. Um, but they do have a really good customer service that you can pester. Oh, God. So what I, <laughs> there's a section at the start of it when I first got these, and it was like, what type of backlit screen do you have? Is it a, a general or something? And I was like, I have no idea. So oh, I just phoned okay. them up and asked them. I was yes, like, what is, what is it? I was like, <laughs> I'm like, you need to select this one, mate. I was like, ah, thank you very much. Um, the same with most things. It's a lot of the techie stuff I just don't understand. So mm. I just phone people up at the companies and ask them to tell me what to do. Um, I, I, I always think that whenever I learn some useless information, I forget something vital like the pin code to my card. I'd much <laughs> rather just ask somebody. Well, my camera restarted. Ooh, yeah, we, there you go. Um, yeah, just ask the right people and say, will this work with my monitor? Yeah. Because there's so many different things when it comes to tech. Yeah. And especially when you move to the PC side of things, it's not all necessarily compatible with one another, mm. um, which is the sole reason I use Mac, because I'm quite simple when it comes to tech stuff. And at least I know that everything in Mac works with everything. Yeah. There's no like, a, you pay premium for the simplicity, but yeah. I'm a simple person, so I, <laughs> I pay stupid tax. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Susan's just got a new BenQ monitor and she hasn't got to calibrate it. Hopefully, Susan, you'll win one, but we'll have to leave that to the gods. Yeah. <laughs> so she thought it would be fine as it had been sharp calibrated, but it is not, as you've said. Will calibrating it also fix the slightly fuzzy edges it sometimes shows on boxes? Oh, slightly fuzzy. That sounds like a fault with the monitor. Oh, Susan. Yeah, I would perhaps contact the people who got it from. Yeah, yeah. There shouldn't be fuzzy edges. No. Um, that's not a calibration issue. That could be... No. I, when I read the reviews in the BenQ monitors, there are loads of people talking about something to do with the unif- uniformity, isn't a word, is it? How uniform the uniform. screen... Uh, <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was trying to change my sentence halfway through a word. It's going all over the place. Uh, but how uniform the, the screen is. And some people yeah. are complaining about it, going, look how bad it is. And some people are like, there's no problem at all. So I don't mm. know if it's a quality assurance issue or anything like that, or where, you know, I don't know what it is, but I think I, I've looked out with a good one, but I saw a lot of reviews of people saying that some of them weren't so even in the corners. So I don't know if that's the problem you're having. Mm. Um, if so, Banjo, pretty really good at just sending you more stuff. Um, oh, that's good. Give them a ring, Susan, see what they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're going to be so mad with me as I was phoning Bank Q again. Can I have? <laughs> <laughs> but no, they, they, I think whenever you're paying a premium for any product, there should always be a support line who can help Absolutely. you out when you're not sure what you're doing. Um, it's a shame that people like Canon don't have those, although they probably need an oh, entire oh. call centre to man all the calls. Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> If you have two screens side by side, would you have them as a V? So both angled towards you as viewing angle will affect color, will that affect colour and brightness? Yes, it will. Um, I do have two screens, actually. I'm looking straight on ahead here. This is my editing screen. It is at the perfect height, perfect distance, all good. So this image I'm editing will be on this one. And then over here to the side is my other monitor, which I don't calibrate at all, actually. Um, because this will have like a list of notes on it or more often than not YouTube videos playing on it. Um, (laughs) And yeah, you can't really have, if you have the V thing, you get a weird contrast thing when you look at the side of a screen and the colours all change, you need to be completely square on. Um, You should be able to touch your monitor with your finger if you put your arm out straight, assuming you're not a giant or anything like that. (laughs) Um, Good eye level. The seats you sit in makes a big difference as well. Um, And where the lights are placed in the room as well has a big impact. And what would you say is the perfect height to have it? Are your eyes kind of mid-screen or toward the so top? Yeah, they're, they're supposed to be mid-screen apparently, but I have mine towards the top. Mm. Um, but I think that's because of the glasses I wear. And yeah. that if I have it mid-screen, I can see the top rim of my glasses here and that gives me a headache. So, yeah. But I've got a really bad back, so maybe that's linked to it. Maybe. We do spend a lot of time in our chairs, don't we? Yeah, like, a disproportionate amount of time. Yeah. Not achieving many steps as we should do, as advised. <laughs> <laughs> um, assuming I can control the colour of the lights in the room, what is ideal colours? And then we've got 6,500. Um, am I assuming this is lights as in like um, ambient lights? 
assuming. Oh, I don't know. So, yes. I, oh, oh, I just saw that pop up as well. Brilliant. Um, I don't know because my landlord fitted my lights and I had no say in the matter. Um, if I could choose, I love your any, <laughs> if I could choose any light in my studio, well, these are quite cool blue LED lights. Um, I would probably just go, yeah, the most natural, like six thousand five hundred, mm. somewhere around there. Um, I've never really thought about it because it's never been something I've had to do. Yeah. Um, I'd probably give it way too much thought if I did have to think about yeah. it. Then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, can you use the Spider Passport with an x right calibrator or does it need to be the same brand? I, do I assume that. so. Uh, yeah, because one's calibrating the camera raw file and one's calibrating the monitor. Yeah, you should. that should be fine. Yeah. Um, I don't see why not. They um, be standard. Yeah, I can't. I can't think of a, a reason why not. So, but we're gonna wave the data color flag. Oh, somebody's just made profile. Oh my god, the difference! Yeah, <laughs> it's one of those moments where you just go, ah, do I need to go and re-edit everything now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody said that they will. Um, they'll be going off to calibrate everything they've got now, and probably edit everything they've got as well. So, um, it's, a, it's very exciting. I do a lot of portfolio reviews, mm-hmm. um, and every now and again, I'll have someone's entire portfolio coming just with the weirdest looking images. Yeah. And the first thing I do is just phone them back. I'm like, do you calibrate your monitors? And I'm like, no, I'm like, right, you need to do that and then resubmit them because I think what you're seeing is very different to what I'm seeing. It's like the mm-hmm. blacks are completely crushed or there's like just so much shadow detail that it looks bizarre because their monitor's not allowing them to see it. So it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a real big, big thing, I guess, just to make yeah. sure that it's all... Yeah, it's so important. Reiterating completely what the whole message of the, tonight is, that colour calibrating is so important. Colour calibrating your camera to your computer is so huge and it'll make a massive difference to what you are editing. And I think also from like an educational point of view, like when, because I spend a lot of time looking at other people's images um, and if I'm looking at them from an uncalibrated screen, mm-hmm. When I try and recreate them, I'll be looking to recreate colour palettes that I think are in fashion, but they're actually nothing like what I'm looking at. Um, So it's like when you, before the web, obviously you'd get everything in print and everyone would have the same magazine looking exactly the same. But now we're looking at that same magazine on like 10,000 different paper stocks because of the monitors we've gotten. Yeah. It's good just to have a good standard, like starting point to go out. This is what it should be looking like. I'm looking at the right version of this image. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, we're almost over by half an hour, so I think... Yes, i better go and get some work done. <laughs> better let you... Um, I get Moggy home as well. Yes, well, that was one of the questions, actually. Does he take Moggy home every night, or does he, Does she live at the studio? She, she comes in the car with me every morning. She actually oh. walks into her little basket and waits. So on oh. Saturdays and Sundays, she gets a little bit confused. She sits in there waiting to come in. Oh. Um, and then at the end of the day, when I get it out again, she climbs back in and we go home in the car. Oh, she's so sweet. Oh, I wish we could get one. Everybody could get one of those too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is definitely a good thing to have in the studio. Yes, absolutely. So calming. Uh, we're getting lots of lovely thank yous flooding in. Great information. Thank you for a really great session. It's been really informative and thoroughly enjoyed by all. So I've made a copy of all of those questions that we didn't get to in case we get time to do them at another time. But Super. thank you so much, Scott. It has been a real, real pleasure to have you on with us. Um, it's been thank you for really, having me. wonderful. Um, and yes, three lucky people from this session will be opening a spider. Well, they'll be opening an email off me soon to ask them for their details to send one out. So um, data color are fabulous and they work with fabulous people such as Scott. So thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful and lovely to meet Margie too. <laughs> <laughs> Super, thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Take care now. Good night, everyone, and thank you so much for your participation. Take care.